day and welcome to another episode of Build Me A Brewery podcast. This is episode two. And if you haven't already, please make sure you have a listen to the introductory episode, which will give you a bit more insight into the main goals and content we'll be covering in the podcast series. And also, please make sure you like our Facebook page, Simply Build Me A Brewery, and also visit our website, www.buildmeabrewery.com.au and subscribe to our newsletter. Today's episode, we continue with the Meet the Brewers series where I sit down with co-founders and head brewers from six Sydney breweries to get their stories, insights and advice. Today's episode, I'm out in Sydney's Inner West again, meeting with founder of Wayward Brewing, Peter Phillip. Peter is a well-known figure within the brewing community, especially in Sydney's Inner West. He actually formed the Inner West Brewers Association back in 2017 in a push to make Inner West Sydney, the, the beer capital of Australia, as, as well as being chairman of the Independent Brewers Association. Pete, he's a, an avid home brewer and, and began his pro career in brewing back in 2012, doing gypsy brewing all over Sydney and New South Wales. He and his wife, Yvette, uh, they officially opened the doors of Wayward in 2015 and they've gone from strength to strength since, picking up several awards and medals across their core beer range, including a, a champion gold medal for their Raspberry Berliner Weisser, which gave them the accolade of, of being the first package producer of the style in Australia. You can tell by the interview that Pete really knows his stuff, and there were so many gems of information and advice to take in that he provided in our chat. So without further delay, I hope you all enjoy my chat with Pete Phillip from Wayward Brewing. I'm currently sitting with Peter Phillip from Wayward Brewing, who has kind enough allowed some time to sit down and talk about how he came to brewing stardom. And yeah, thanks for coming along. Yeah, thanks, Chris. Uh, welcome to Camperdown. Yeah, I finally got that right. Well, <laughs> we spent a <laughs> so, couple takes there. Am I in Annandale or we, Camperdown? We, we're, actually, <laughs> we're actually on the border between uh, Annandale. The back of the brewery is actually in Annandale and the front of the brewery is in Camperdown. But so we, we're on the border. We, we uh, call ourselves residents of Camperdown, so uh, we got that right eventually. <laughs> yeah, so. excellent. I guess just to kick things off, I, I've given the uh, audience a, a short introduction mm-hmm. about yourself, Wayward, so I guess uh, take a couple of moments now just to tell a bit about how you got into craft brewing. Um, I know you've been an avid home brewer for many years before you turned pro, so give us a, a bit of a, a rundown. Yeah, I really came to uh, love beer uh, through living in the UK. So I lived there for five years and, you know, I was – the uh, typical uni student um, swilling uh, cheap lagers in Halifax, Nova Scotia when I grew up. Um, and when I went to the UK, it was like a revelation having a real ale that actually had flavor and, and tasted of hops and things like that. So that be, uh, kicked off a love affair of, of European beers and UK beers. Um, and that was, you know, that was really an adventure and, you know, when I was there for five years, really, I don't think I drank a lager. I tried not to, at least. Um, might have drank one or two and, and three o'clock in the morning or something like that. <laughs> but um, and then when uh, my wife and I moved to Australia in 97, um, um, I found that I couldn't find any of those beers anymore. So I had to brew them myself. So that's I started out like everybody else, getting a kilo and um, thought I was a genius because I brewed a, um, you know, a, an English bitter and thought, oh, shit, this is easy. Um, and but, you know, w- with with brewing, you realize as you go on that the more you know, the less you know. So uh, that's really what became a, a, an obsession for the next 10 years of, of home brewing. Yeah, and uh, how how soon was it? You, you said that you were starting with the kits, the extract stuff, probably in the beginning. Uh, how soon did you make that jump to all grain? Oh, well, it, uh, another aspect of my personality is that I'm a control freak. So after this, uh, I've started experimenting. I think I actually dry hopped the first batch that I did um, just because the guy in the shop said that was a cool thing to do. Mm. Didn't know what it was, didn't know how to do it, but just, you know, dump some hops in the, uh, in the fermenter at the end of fermentation. But uh, I think I did maybe one more kit and then at, uh, from that point, uh, I started doing partial grain batches and then all grain within kind of 
two months, I think. And, um, yeah, and, and, and that's where my experimentation with different styles and trying to melt different, different techniques came from and polishing, polishing the skills. And uh, what can you recall that first beer you brewed? And what it was? Well, the first one was was yeah, an English bitter. English bitter. Yeah, um, and it was uh, dry hopped with Fuggles, um, and uh, and I thought it was quite delicious, really, but um, probably pretty awful. But I think uh, all us home brewers think uh, think it tastes amazing because it's our first that we've ever brewed. And yeah, yeah. all right, excellent. I guess career wise, uh, what what were you doing before pro brewing? So. Uh, a bit of a serial entrepreneur. I, I started uh, my first company when I was 18 in Canada. Um, then started a couple of companies there. Was was working for myself in the UK, but also worked for Oracle. Then came to the U- uh, came to Australia um, <clears throat> and started working um, building a, building a company here. I wasn't the founder of it, but uh, founded a technology product in the superannuation industry. And uh, went on to um, uh, own part of that company um, and build it up over the next, I guess, 20 years, ran that uh, until, um, until starting Wayward, you know, which was in 2012. Well, wow. okay. Yeah. So you actually uh, had a, a bit of a career as a gypsy brewer before opening up. Is that right? Yeah. So 2012... I decided I was going to. I, I've been thinking about it for a couple of years, uh, and looked at a few spaces, um, and was looking around Balmain. I was living in Roselle, look, trying to get set up something on the peninsula. But uh, you know, I'm sure we'll get into this. The challenges of finding the right location were was incredibly difficult to find landlords and the right uh, landlords that, that understood what we were trying to achieve. Um, and, uh, so that had several false starts, but in 2012 launched wayward and, uh, did that as a, as a, as a gypsy brewer. So, you know, brewed it, um, Riverside, I think it was the first batch, uh, brewed a batch at, uh, Illawarra Brewing Company and, oh God, a few other, um, breweries around. And, and how did you find adjusting to all the different systems? Do you think it played a, a part in you becoming a better brewer, understanding different systems, being able to adjust? Well, look, uh, I mean, ultimately, uh, when you're gypsy brewing, you know, it's not like a, a brewer hands you the keys and walks away. Uh, you know, you're relying on the brewer that's the, the head brewer of whoever's, whoever system you're using mm-hmm. to um, adjust and develop a recipe. You know, you're scaling up a homebrew recipe or... Uh, you've got a concept that you're starting with. Um, it's always important to consult with with the people that that actually run that brewery every day because everything's every every system behaves differently. So yeah, look, I think that that was what that did um, teach me was a little bit of um, what you know. I saw several systems, so I knew what I wanted and what I didn't want when we um, when we designed our our brewery. And for the listeners who maybe uh, that clued up on what gypsy brewing is. I, uh, they've probably also heard of contract brewing as well. Yeah. There's, there's a s- slight difference between the two. Oh, look, there, right? there's, there's uh, perhaps a philosophical difference. Um, you know, we get people coming to us saying, can you contract to brew a beer? And we say, great, what's your recipe? And they go, oh, I don't have a recipe. Um, I just want to create a beer. Me and my mates want to, you know, create a, a brand. Um so there's, that's probably one end of the spectrum. Mm-hmm. Uh, the other end of the spectrum is uh, we've had many, many um, uh, gypsy brewers through Wayward, people like, you know, Shenanigans and, um, uh, you know, Sunday Road started out brewing here. Um, you know, even Capital did a couple of brews here. So we've tried to, um, you know, involve gypsy brewers in our, in our history and um, um, lost track there. What was the question? Uh, uh, yeah, I guess the number of oh, gypsy difference, brewers. Difference that, between know, gypsies, yeah. gypsy brewing and contract brewing. I mean, yeah, so gypsy brewing is really where somebody is a, a more or less qualified brewer and they're coming in and they're 
and they're more um, more engaged, I guess, or more involved in the brewing. They just need a system to brew on, really. Yeah, yeah, and like I said, it it's. I think some people believe that you know you kind of hand over the keys and away they go. It, it's it's really a consultative process. I mean, in, in our in our case, it's always our brewers who are qualified and understand our systems that are doing the brewing, but the um, the uh, gypsy brewers are. It's their recipe. It's, you know, we're taking their advice on exactly how they want it brewed and we're just following their instructions. So you your roots coming from that gypsy side as well, um, going from, you know, brewery into brewery around Sydney and even down to Illawarra. For someone who, I guess, and, and this is probably a common problem um, facing a lot of aspiring brewery owners is, not having enough capital behind them and not being able to source capital from your, your big banks or you know not having an actually proven concept. Do you think uh, uh, gypsy brewing and contract brewing is a uh, practical way to start out? It's a, it's a viable way to start out, but you have to start out, uh, you have to understand um, what it is and what it isn't. It's not a way to make money, first and foremost. Right, so you will never make money as a gypsy, gypsy brewer um, uh, if you go into it understanding that this is uh, a an experiment. Um, you don't want to risk all your capital. You don't know if it's going to work or not. You don't know if you have a recipe or a brand or all those things. If you think about it as a low, a relatively low risk way to um, lose money, lose a little bit of money figuring out whether you're on the right track, then it's, then it's a reasonable way forward. Um, if you believe that you're going to grow, uh, grow a brand to, um, to a, a serious, um, uh, the, sorry, I should say, then you're in the realms of contract brewing. If you really, really want to launch a brand and, and, you, and there are people who have done that launched brands purely on contract, right? It, but it's a different model. You need capital behind you to do serious uh, co- contract brewing because essentially you're going out and contracting somebody to, to make, you know, hundreds of thousands of kegs and hundreds of thousands of, of cases and you need the capital to do that. So it's not necessarily a way. So I'm talking about gypsy brewing, which is generally smaller scale, generally batch to batch, um, you know, um, generally small packaging runs, and, uh, and, and it is a way to kind of um, kickstart what you're doing. So, and, and that's the way I've always treated um, or, or viewed gypsy brewing and contract brewing is a lot of them aren't making money. If they're lucky, they break even. But it is a way to get your brand out there, get, a, get some exposure, I guess dip your feet in the water before actually investing in stainless. Yeah, that, yeah. You know. I mean, it's like I used to joke with – friends that you know they'd be drinking a pint and i go yeah it's what we're doing how are you doing peter oh we're doing great that pint i only lost 50 cents on that pint you're drinking and they just shake their head and go wait a minute what do you mean you lost 50 cents <laughs> losing 50 cents on every pint how can that possibly be well it's just it's expensive mm. right you're paying you're paying for somebody else's stainless you're paying for somebody else's rent you're paying for somebody else's uh wages yep. right so it's not that you're you know you're paying a lot more you're just not investing in your own stainless you're helping to pay off somebody else's stainless yeah okay excellent so pete when you decided to launch waywood and you had a actual physical premises uh what sort of concept did you want to start off with was it a, a brew pub concept or is the main goal to become production so you can sell your beers national or into international markets you want yeah, to talk we, about that we were a production brewery from day one. The, the uh, tap room is an ancillary to the production business. So I think that's the first decision that everybody has to make is, are you going to be a production brewery or are you going to be a brew pub? Uh, you, and don't get confused as to what you want to be. Uh, a lot of guys that come through to me to, and ask me for advice now, I say, go, you know, go west find a little a little town that doesn't have a brewery you might have an abandoned pub that's for sale buy the pub you know have some space at the back put a shed at the back and become a brew pub uh, it's a great business model i mean 
except in COVID. But yeah. uh, until COVID, it was a great business model um, because you're, you know, you're making the beer at wholesale and you're selling it at retail, right? You're completely bypassing the channel and you're making all of that margin. So it's a profitable business model from day one. We have now, you know, over 650 breweries in Australia. It is a crowded market. Um, there's, there is dwindling, um, well, there's, there's increasing competition for shelf space. Uh, retailers are getting much sharper and much, uh, much more selective. Um, and it's harder and harder to get distribution. If you're, if you intend to be a production brewery, um, you need to scale up, uh, uh, appropriately. There's sort of an adage that, um, you know, breweries lose money until they make a million liters. Um, I think it's actually a million and a half, right? And if you're in an expensive city like Sydney, it could be higher than that. So, yeah, you really need a plan of how you are going to get to at least a million liters before you are a viable business. Right. Yeah, and that's that's great advice. And I guess um, I know along my journey of, you know, investigating how to open a brewery is, is just – having those sort of realities you know as i was saying to pat when i sat down with him from willie the boatman it's it's not all about making beer and drinking out the bar with your mates there's a there's it's a natural small business and uh well i i, st- I started a brewery because i love brewing mm. and i think the last time i was on the tools was when our head brewer sean went on his uh honeymoon and um you know um i did everything for six weeks. I'll probably brew it a few times after that, but that was probably 2017, right? I haven't been on the tools for three years and I started a brewery because I love brewing, right? The, the reality is that the first thing you need to do is decide whether you want to be a brewer or whether you want to run a business. If you want to have a successful business, then you cannot do both. It's impossible. Mm -hmm. Um, Running a business like this is a, uh, in the beginning, it'll be an 80 hour a week job. So if you've got kids, um, you're not going to see your kids and your wife, right? And, uh, or you can be a brewer, right? And hire somebody to run the brewery, but you can't do both. Yeah, good advice. I guess uh, another topic I'd like to sort of talk about is inspiration behind your beers, because I know Waywood take on a lot of European classic style beers, but with your own twist on it. Do you want to talk about sort of recipe beer designs and maybe what uh, an aspiring brewery owner should focus on as their core range or or how many there should be in a core range starting out? Yeah, look, I think it's really important to have um, a clear vision of what you, what you want to achieve. I mean, my style was always kind of the reason I like the name wayward is it, kind of suggests that you're a little bit off off in left field but perhaps you mean to be off in left field it's purposefully um off kilter i guess um and so we always like to put a twist in in the beers but again in one of my other philosophies is is i really like very very drink drinkable beers so drinkability is is absolutely key so we tend not to do you know we don't tend to do things like pastry stouts and milkshake IPAs. I mean, not to say that there's anything wrong with those or that we, or that we haven't done them from time to time, just or the guys haven't done a pilot batch of that. Um, but it's just not where we, you know, we feel we want to be in the marketplace. We want to have drinkable beers that people like to consume uh, that have a twist, but it's not, it's a, a, a pat on the back, not a, not a smack in the face kind of thing. So in the early days, my stylistic leanings were very European focused. So we, you know, we did, um, uh, you know, we've always done Berliner Weisses and um, Bier de Gardes and German styles. And um, so um, when Sean uh, came on board as, as our head brewer, his stylistic cleanings were much more American styles, much more IPA. So there was an interesting time where we were melding all of those sorts of um, influences. 
and that's that's good. Um, we and I guess if you look at our Gabs beers, which are kind of typically the crazier end of the spectrum, a lot of our Gabs beers have become core range. So they were they were surprising at the time, or maybe a little bit off kilter at the time, but have become more mainstream. Oatmeal IPA, right? I mean, nobody heard of really doing an oatmeal no. IPA when we brought, brought out Otis. Uh, not that it was unknown. I mean, the other thing I like to say is that there's never been a beer that's not been brewed before, so I don't think there's much, much original. Everybody's borrowing off of things that have gone before them, but certainly, um, you know, it, it's it's good to try to do something different. And, and what... What's a healthy number starting out? Because I, I see a lot of small breweries that are probably in their first couple of years, but they've got 20 different beers um, and, you know, they're probably held back by the capacity of their tanks and, you know, they've probably started out small. Um, what's a healthy number to sort of kick things off? Should someone start off with just one beer, focus on that, get it out the market and then build from there or, or – or, there needs to be variety from the very beginning. Look, w- one beer is the way to start because I believe um, if you really are going to have a core range, right? I mean, there's a lot of breweries who just really don't have much of a core range uh, and they've made their name strictly on, uh, well, you know, they've developed a core range over time, but they started out life um, as batch brewers i mean that's really what batch was when it started out they you know chris and andrew said oh we're never going to brew the same beer twice now people demand that your popular beers get brought back so that's how um you know core range is developed and you know they certainly have a core range um but don't underestimate the complexity of managing multiple SKU stock keeping units in the channel right and keeping up with that if you don't if you're not efficient it's going to be, um, you know, a millstone around your neck that, that really, and you know, the other thing is you don't want to be disappointing people in the channel. So if you commit to do, doing something as a core range, it means it has to always be available. So, you know, the time that you tell a retailer that, oh, my core range, one of my core range beers is not available. Well, you know, they might stop stocking it. Mm. So it's crucial that you can live up to your commitments. And if you can't, then, you know, just be a a small batch um, seasonal, you know, brewer. That's that's a valid business model. Mm. And if we could just quickly, I think we might have milled over it, but the sort of system that you guys started out brewing on when you first opened Waywood, that's, that's obviously evolved over the years yeah. um, you've expanded so what what did you start out brewing on so we've we started out and still have a, a 20 heck four vessel system um, so it's got a separate mash and louder ton um, and a separate whirlpool so um, I brewed that was one of the things that when I was brewing on on two vessel systems I really didn't didn't like I didn't like the efficiency um, both in uh, uh, extract efficiency and um, time efficiency, production efficiency. Um, so we've uh, that's the, still the system we have. We've got um, uh, 20, uh, 40, and 60 heck uh, fermenters and bright tanks. Um, so that's single, double, or triple batches. Um, we've also got a little 300 liter pilot system, which the guys just use to play around on. That, that develops beers just for the tap room. Um, and, um, yeah, so we've continued to expand that. So that's a direct fired system, but we're going to a uh, continuous, uh, hot liquor, um, system and, uh, yeah. And, uh, when you went about sourcing the equipment, did you engage a, a broker or did you, you know, in, get involved with a consultant that helped you, you know, guide you through the process or, um, Look, wisely or not, I mean, I think that it's worked out for us. You know, Sean and I uh, spent a lot of time designing what we wanted, and then uh, I actually made uh, three trips to Japan, uh, sorry, to uh, China, to um, to source suppliers, uh, interview suppliers, inspect equipment, 
uh, helped design the equipment. So that was, um, you know, that was a big investment, but we, we developed a relationship with a, a supplier in China that, that's worked out really, really well for us, and they've been fantastic. Were you hesitant about quality? Getting someone from China. Uh, yes, that's why I made three trips. Yeah, you know, I mean, one trip I had a, I had to um, have a translator, um, and we went to probably twenty different factories, and some of them, I don't think I would make dog food in those tanks. Right? right. I mean, they were awful. Right. So you take a look at those, you nod politely, and you move on. Right. And go to the next one, and then. As you get more experience and talk to other brewers, you do get other contacts. So uh, that's how I got onto uh, uh, the supplier that we use now. Yeah, excellent. I guess moving on to lessons learned, you've obviously had a, a lot of experience in, in pro brewing and have uh, the foresight to sort of share um, the do's and don'ts. So I guess uh, to start off this part of the, the uh, interview, what would you say – were the biggest challenges you faced um, opening up? Hmm. Um, <clears throat> they they can kind of there's thousands of challenges, but uh, they can kind of roughly be broken up into um, categories. So one is compliance and regulatory. Um, uh, one is dealing with landlords. And property owners, uh, assuming that you you know you, the ideal situation is that you buy a property and you own it, right? Uh, and that's again the other reason why I recommend to people that they find somewhere in the country that they can own. Um, but regulatory wise, having a a council that's uh, open to breweries, so that's why we started the Inner West Brewery Association was to kind of get the Inner West Council supportive of breweries yep. because we had uh, all the breweries in the West had such challenge uh, or the original five that were in the association. Um, <clears throat> so finding a council that's, that's accommodating is super important. There's all kinds of, I think most people believe that, that, you know, design of the system and, and the equipment and the f- flow of the, of your production system is going to be a massive, massive challenge. It, it's not. I mean, if you understand process design, and you know, I happen, I happen to have some uh, partners in the business that are uh, engineers, and, and I think like an engineer, you can design all that. And if you don't think like that, then you need to get a consultant, right? Or even if you do think like that, get a consultant, because confirming all those things and confirming the right and wrong way to operate. Um, is is a big 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 thing um it's probably not the biggest challenge you're going to you're going to encounter because there are lots of experts out there that are extremely knowledgeable about how to do this stuff um it, the the bigger the bigger challenges are you know having enough time capital uh marketing now business now to actually run a business Right, and underestimate, <clears throat> underestimating the amount of time that all these things will take. I mean, I've, I've managed, started businesses and managed businesses and done project management my, pretty much my entire adult life. And going into this, I thought, look, I'm a good project manager. I'll be, you know, I know how to run things in parallel. I know how to sequence things. I know how to do these things. But so many things in breweries are must be sequential. You know, you cannot get a trade waste um, permit until you have an occupancy certificate, until you have equipment. You can't get all of those things until you have built your brewery. You can't build your brewery until you have, um, you know, consent. You can't get consent or you can't get an excise license until you have your consent. You can't get consent until you have a space. You can't get space until you do X, Y, and Z. So many of these things cannot be done in parallel. And that's what I think most people underestimate is the sequence of events that needs to go into this is around a thousand items long. And very few of them can be doubled up or 
bypassed or done in parallel to to squeeze the time you know everybody <clears throat> um everybody will tell you that you know pick a budget and then double it and double the time yep and you know yeah, it, There'd be people listening to this now that say, well, I'm a good project manager. I won't do that. But, you know, I haven't met anybody who hasn't done that. I have heard that uh, statement many times before on other, other podcasts and other mm-hmm. people in the industry is, yeah, double double your time, double your budget or triple your budget. It's never what you first sort of forecast. So Yeah, mm-hmm. that's that's right. I mean, mm-hmm. things, um, things just, uh, you know, Trade waste is one of those things that kind of a lot of people forget about. And, um, you know, we didn't forget about it, but we we designed something that we thought was fit for purpose, um, that was basic but fit for purpose. And then trade waste come along and go, no, you need this. You need to have a, uh, a meter that costs $10,000. Bang. And it's non-negotiable. You can't operate it with that. Mm-hmm. That's, just, that's just a meter. Well... A water meter. And you say, well, what about a water meter like that does this? No, this one. It's $10,000. Yeah. Okay. And it, and it adds nothing. It adds nothing to your, you know, the quality of your beers or anything. It's just counting the water that goes through the system. Right. And there will be, there are a thousand things like that, that, you know, unfortunately in Australia, we live in a highly regulated uh, environment. You know, have, as everybody counted the, you know, well, you know, when we started, we didn't have um, container deposit scheme. Container deposit scheme comes in, adds 13 cents to every every can or bottle that you create. And, you know, as much as people say, oh, well, that got added to the price, it gets added and then it gets deducted because, you know, it's a competitive competitive environment. Mm, well, craft, craft beer is, is already... Um, viewed as very expensive to the market that's right so you don't need more things to be added on top to to give that perception so so when you guys started out um did you consider doing a a business plan um did did uh um something written down on paper to show banks or you know to actually have it structured in your mind of how you're going to like you're saying sequentially you know roll it all out you need you really need three things so Absolutely, you have to have a business plan. If you don't have a business plan, you're screwed. Um, uh, I mean, your business plan, again, it has to scale with the size of the business. Coming, If you're thinking about doing a brew pub, right, um, there's many successful brew pubs out there that you know might be uh, husband and wife, and you know their business is their life. Um, you know, one of them works at the back brewing, one of them works at the front, um, front of house, and you've got a couple of casual staff and you know what, you don't need a long business plan for that. Um, you do need a brand strategy. Everybody must have a marketing and brand strategy. So what does your brand mean? Why are people buying your brand? Because when people buy a beer, um, they don't do it with blindfolds on, you know, they don't do it based on just solely on the taste, they do it based on uh, what you represent. And that's that has to be embodied in your brand. Mm-hmm. Um, and then the third thing you need to have is a, a project plan. And I would say the fourth thing you need, which is part of the business plan, is a capital plan, how, you are, how you're going to raise money to do this because it's going to take a lot of money. And, and just on the topic of money and uh you don't have to sort of uh, share with us if you're uncomfortable with it, but um, how did you guys go about funding the brewery and, and roughly you know, a ballpark figure of how much you started with? So uh, my house is, is um, leveraged to the hilt, you know, I uh, borrowed every penny I can, I can borrow against my house, which is, mo- which is a common story amongst, um, amongst brewers. We've, I've, got, I've had a few friends put in some money um, so I've got a few uh, shareholders. I'm still the majority shareholder. And we have managed to raise some money from the banks over time. Right? So it's a combination. And we, um, we definitely bootstrapped ourselves with insufficient, uh, insufficient capital, which I wouldn't do again. 
um, because it's pretty damn stressful not knowing whether you can afford to pay salaries or um, pay your rent. But um, we did it. And I think the initial investment was, it's in the ballpark of a million to a million and a half. Um, and then we've probably spent perhaps not quite that much again, but probably actually have. I mean, if you, if you factor in, you know, you just got to factor in everything, getting vans for deliveries, you know, buying computers for staff, you know, it's, it's like all these, all these things cost money and you need them to operate. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, you've, and again, that's the, the, you know, the other adage is that it costs Mm -hmm. Probably to create a production brewery, you have to factor in just on equipment about a, a, a dollar per and per liter of annual production. So just the stainless is going to cost you a million dollars if you want to make a million liters, which is your break even. And then um, commissioning, setting up all the services around it are probably going to be 50, another 50% to 100% of that. And then... Um, and then getting to that is, you know, another 50% of that to have the business services around you, like, um, you know, sufficient working capital to make sure you can pay people and so on. Yeah, yeah. And uh, a lot of people don't realize how, how expensive it is. It's probably uh, one of the most capital intense businesses or small businesses that start out. Like I was saying to Pat the other day, it's uh, it's not like a small online website or shop that you're um, opening up uh, with, you know, a couple hundred dollars. It's, uh, you know, we're talking hundreds of thousands of dollars to start up. And yeah. that's just probably on the low end of the scale. Yeah, right? and, and, and labor intensive, right? Mm-hmm. Because um, the other benchmark we use in the IBA, which is kind of based on our, uh, our membership, is that... Um, for every million liters of annual production, you pretty much need at least 30 people to do that. So your team will be 30 people. It takes a big brewer, you know, um, the, the big boys are so automated and so um, highly integrated that it takes them two people to do that. So it's a 15 to one employment ratio between big brewers and small brewers. So you are gonna be carrying lots and lots of staff to do this stuff. And that's so, where you start to see the difference in, you know, unit prices and, you know, cost to produce a, a case of beer or correct. Yeah. yeah. I mean you don't get to serious economies of scale until you're until you're hitting close to a million liters. Um, and you know, that's when you start to make profit on your on your packaged product. Um, so it, it's crucial that if you you know don't be there's a there's a no man's land between a brew pub and a production brewery, right? So a brew pub can survive doing, you know, 10,000 liters a year, right? Um, in, maybe, maybe you can get a brew pub up to 50,000 liters a year. If it's, and then, you know, maybe you can start doing small scale packaging and supplying pubs around you kind of thing, right? That's kind of the, the village brewery or the little regional brewery uh, model, um, as opposed to saying, no, I want to be uh, a production brewery that has cans on the shelf in Dan, Dan Murphy's. Well, you're saying that you want to, you, you're not going to make a profit until you get to a million liters. So you've got to have a plan to get to a million liters. If you, to get to have a plan to get to half a million liters means that you've got a plan to lose money. So I think that's what most people don't understand is that, you just are going to continually be chasing your tail until you get to a profitable situation and understand all of your costs and, you know, use these benchmarks uh, to plan accordingly. You know, do you want to manage 30 people in, a, in your business, right? Well, you can't do that and be the head brewer. You, know, you can manage your little brew team. But you can't manage 30 people mm. in a business if you're the head brewer. You've got to realize when to step back and look at running the business. Or- That's right. I mean, you, well, I mean, I'm not saying don't be the, don't be the head brewer. If you mm. love brewing and you've got a vision, be the head brewer. But it means that at 
3 p.m. or 3.30, you clock off, you go home and you put your feet up, Mm -hmm. right? And you let the general manager or the CEO that you've hired or your business partner, whoever that is, they're running the business and you're, you know, in effect reporting to them, Mm -hmm. right? That's the only way that works uh, that I've seen anyways. I've never seen somebody successfully um, spend all day brewing and then, and then somehow be able to manage uh, a growing business. Mm -hmm. And uh, if you were to do it all over again, um, with what you've learnt now and experience under your, under your, under what you've been doing here, uh, way, what look, would I, you do differently? I'm not sure I'd do much differently. I probably would have raised more money at the beginning, and um, you know, it's uh, it's kind of it's easy to be caught up in the in the buzz of doing what you're doing. You know, there's that, there's that mid tier where you're almost making money You're making, you know, two or 300,000 liters of beer a year and you're packaging and you're starting to get some success, some success in the channel and you get some sales guys where you just go, Oh my God, this is awesome. This is so fun, right? This is really good. And, and you can take your foot off the accelerator, right? So we, um, we went through a little phase where perhaps we, we, should have just been much more focused on on doing a few things and doing them extremely well rather than trying to because we were all getting excited about oh let's do this and let's do that and let's do this and it wasn't until we really really honed down our product strategy and uh and and you know uh that we saw really the massive growth happen Mm -hmm. Um, so yeah that's possibly i would just would have would have had more money in the back pocket, Mm. maybe raised a bit more capital, um, so that, uh, so that we could have grown faster. So probably starting out a bit bigger. Um, I think, I think our size is okay. Um, you know, we've grown, managed to grow into adjacent, uh, units to, to continue to, um, have space because, you know, just the amount of space that a brewery uses is, is staggering. Um, you know, I remember looking at spaces when I first started out thinking, oh, you know, a couple hundred square meters, you know, I can, we can probably make it work in that. And you do these little floor plans and, and shit. I mean, we're just like, it's just impossible. Like it just uses so much space. Mm-hmm. Uh, so there's, but no, we're happy with where we are. We're happy with the beers. Um, we're happy with the product strategy. Um, yeah. Well, I'm starting to see your beers absolutely everywhere, and, and I can't say I've had a bad beer um, from you guys. Actually, uh, yeah, thanks. Love, um, love your pale ale and, and 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 the pilsner. I think I've had your, your red ale as well. So, um, but uh, yeah, really starting to see every in every bottle store actually. Yeah, look, it's important to um, you know everybody's got a signature beer. Uh, you know, ours that I don't think anybody could have predicted that ours would have been a raspberry Berliner Weiss. <laughs> I mean, I think when we first brewed uh, a Berliner Weiss, I think we were the first packaging brewery, maybe the second to do it, but certainly the first on a national scale to do it. And, um, you know, I just don't think 15 years ago anybody would have said, most people didn't even know what a Berliner Weiss was, that it could be. Um, you know, a nationally stocked beer that's that's as popular as it is. So I think that's important to have a signature signature beer and a signature brand that can um, that can um, pull through a lot of uh, enable the rest of the growth to happen. Yeah, excellent. Coming towards the end, and I, I do appreciate you spending you know at least an hour with us, Pete. But uh, I want to get your take on the future of the craft beer industry, um, uh, you know, what, what you think beer trends are, you know, the hazies, the sours, what room is left in the market for growth here in Australia for craft beer, if you want to maybe Mm -hmm. share some insights there. Yeah. Well, I'll just draw on really, um, uh, my experience as, uh, as chair of the IBA, um, in that, you know, we've, We've set a vision uh, for the industry. Or the industry set a vision for itself of getting to 15% uh, by 
by volume by 2025. Um, so in the next five years, we do need to grow massively. And that's really all about, I guess, convincing non, non craft, what I'd call craft beer drinkers that there's a craft beer for everyone. So, you know, I'm of the school that uh, I don't care. You know, I don't care that your beer is not super bitter or super hoppy or super, you know, it doesn't need to be sours, doesn't need to be big IPAs. You know, a really well-brewed lager um, is, a, is a beautiful beer to behold if, you, if it's well-brewed and it's made with love, right? So we need to convince consumers that there's a craft beer for everybody or an indie beer for everybody. And so um, that's what we're focused on. If we do that and the industry is, is creating beers uh, with a lot of quality, then we will bring those people along. Right? We, will con- we will convince the consumers of the benefits of buying independent beer. So, but, you know, it just takes laser focus on quality and, and ensuring consistency because all you need is for somebody to, you know, crack their first independent beer and it's gone off or it's oxidized or it's, you know, not balanced. And they go, oh, yeah, I knew I wasn't going to like that. Right. Um, so that's, I guess, where, you know, I, I tell everybody that will listen, focus, focus on quality. You know, you need to build processes that, that work and make money, but they also need to be producing beers that are really, really well brewed. Unfortunately, it's, it's good in most cases. Right. It's good in most cases. Bad independent beers uh, are not prevalent, but they do happen out there. Right? And we need we as an industry need to be critical enough on ourselves that we're calling that out. Right. There's no there's no benefit in saying that a bad beer is is good. Right. We need to be honest with ourselves and honest with our colleagues. And that's why competition is so important right because it's a way to benchmark yourself and you know you do hear a lot of people going oh well you know i didn't my beer didn't do well in competition all the you know judges mustn't have understood my beer well they probably did they probably got it and that's probably the best way to get feedback uh, about your beer rather than taking to a mate's house and him just you know no everybody's gonna give somebody a beer they're gonna say they love it and and you know a lot of unbalanced beers um are, can be very popular. I mean, you know, I go to the States all the time and, you know, you drink massive West Coast IPAs, you know, 8% monsters that are 150 BU and you just go, it's not a balanced beer. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's maybe well brewed. It, some people might like it, but to me, I don't want to drink more than a small glass of that. Mm-hmm. And, um, to me, it's, it misses out on the drinkability factor, and that's kind of where I think we need to go as an industry um, to to convince people to move over to um, drinking independent beer. And how has uh, COVID hit you guys? How have you how have you managed um, the business in, in this time? Well, it fucked us pretty hard in the beginning. Uh, you know, when we had to close down the venue. Uh, because, you know, uh, even though we are a production brewery, a fair amount of our revenue and a good, good portion of our profit comes out of the tap room because it is very profitable. So, I mean, I guess that's the other piece of advice I'd have for anybody that you need to understand the, where the where the tap room factors into your thinking. And I'd recommend everybody has a tap room because you in the early days, you will rely on that for cash flow. Uh, so it's absolutely vital. But... Uh, unless you've got a lot of money behind you, right? Which is rare. <laughs> um, and I still recommend you do it. So um, so that hit us hard. Um, fortunately, we had some uh, some good landlords that helped us out a little bit. You know, JobKeeper helped us out. Uh, so we survived through that. And, you know, our, our local consumers really, really got behind us and started buying beer from the curbside takeaway and... Um, so you've got to be nimble and COVID taught us that we're perhaps not, not as nimble as we, we should have been, but yeah, a lot of the things that we did there, we're just carrying through as a normal business process now. 
And your your sort of uh, strategy, Pat from Willie um, was saying they've actually done a, a 180 on how they're approaching the market. They're not really going after taps anymore. They're, they're going after packaging, getting to bottle shops. They're able to, to get get money back quicker than you know from the hotels and pubs is, is that something that wayward's doing yeah well, well? We, we, we probably don't have time to go into it but essentially uh, australia has an anti-competitive um tap uh you know on-premise system where large breweries use their unlimited access to capital to lock up taps so that's fundamentally anti-competitive i believe um we ACCC made a ruling that it wasn't any competitive. We are going to be re- re-addressing that as part of our next year's strategy with the IBA. Um, it's a hobby horse of mine. It essentially means that it's incredibly difficult to get taps. You know, you look in the inner west, a typical pub may have one or two flexible taps, and there's, what, 10 Inner West, 10 very good Inner West breweries, all making excellent beers, competing for those two taps. So it means that even if the publican is is very open-minded, you will be rotating through and you will get a tap one week out of 10 weeks. Mm -hmm. That's not viable. You can't build a business around that. Mm -hmm. So we made that pivot around 18 months ago uh, to focus on mostly packaged beer because that's more of a democratic um, access, you yeah. know, but it's getting very, very crowded now, right? Because now you've got all these breweries competing for shelf space, and you can't can't keep on putting more and more fridges into bottle shops. Yeah. Well, once again, Pete, thanks very much for no worries, spending uh, a good hour yeah. with us. Uh, any closing thoughts or advice? Look, um, I think I think we've um, we've covered off a lot of ground. Um, so you know, I I hope people don't feel like I'm trying to pour cold water on their on their dreams um, I just know it's been a uh, you know an incredibly difficult eight years for us uh, it's been fun it's been you know I would not go back to the corporate world um, in superannuation technology it, you know you, there's not enough money to to uh, pay me to do that uh, so um, yeah follow your dream but be realistic i guess is the is the um advice and uh yeah keep on listening to podcasts like this to um give you a piece of advice and you know uh i'm sure your other um your other uh, episodes will have a lot of other good feedback that i didn't touch on so yeah uh, thanks chris absolutely and uh, once again i very much uh, appreciate you coming out and, and that's what this podcast is about um being uh, a reality check for the industry so um anything you'd like to plug um for wayward any upcoming events uh, beers coming out or anything like that well we've always got our we've got monthly seasonals out we just had our um fifth birthday uh, it's kind of celebrating the, the tap room. The tap room opened five years ago. We've been going for eight, but um, we kind of our unofficial birthday is is the date we opened the tap room. That's what most people um, think. So, double raspberry in shops now. Excellent, excellent. Well, uh, Pete from Wayward Brewing, guys, hope you enjoyed it. Thanks for listening to the Build Me A Brewery podcast and I do hope you enjoyed today's episode. Please remember to like, follow or subscribe across all our social media handles and if you visit our website www.buildmeabrewery.com.au and subscribe to our mailing list, you can get exclusive content such as free ebooks and transcripts on all our podcast episodes. So keep on listening and stay tuned for more episodes of the Build Me A Brewery podcast.